Welcome to our video introducing the simplified joints method for analyzing a truss. We're working out of chapter 7, section 1, subsection 4. We're going to analyze a parallel cord truss, which is simple span and has 16 square bays. In a previous video, we did the so-called exploded view analysis for a truss, where we showed all the joints and all the members as free bodies. And that was a really important exercise because it took you through the thought process of not only what is the equilibrium on each of those members, but how, or, and joints, but how are forces transferred between them. In the process of doing that, you learn that in some sense the members are not very interesting. They mainly serve to pass forces through to the joints. And the joints presented the useful information to us in terms of applying the rules of equilibrium to the joints is what uh, allowed us to find new forces or new unknown forces in the system, previously unknown forces. So we're going to now look at a simplified bookkeeping system for analyzing these problems. And you're probably happy to know that such a thing exists because in the exploded view, we had lots and lots of forces. We had lots of free bodies and we were also drawing the forces to scale which meant you actually had to be able to figure out how far to space the joints and members apart in order to have enough space to draw the arrows to scale. So in some sense, it was rather confusing because you had to analyze the structure and figure out what the size of the forces were before you drew the diagram, but the diagram was your method of performing the analysis and keeping track of your results as you went along. So now that we've been through that more detailed exercise and we have verbalized all the exchanges of forces that took place there, we're now going to do a simplified bookkeeping system for tracking the informal tr forces and tr internal forces in trusses by focusing on the forces on the joints and playing down the forces on the members. So when we do a diagram, we're actually going to show the joints with all the proper relationships to each other, but we're going to gray out or dash out the members. But we understand that those members are still there. And it's very useful to you uh, to continue on verbalizing as if those members were there. That will help you understand all the exchanges of forces but you don't have to keep every one of those members on your diagram because you understand that in some sense they are simply uh, serving as mediators of exchange of force between joints. So we have two, four, six, eight bays to the symmetry line and then we have eight more bays on the right. We have a 1p force on each of the interior vertices, a 0.5p force on the two end vertices. We have a total of 16 bays, and p is the amount of force that's associated with one bay. So if we have 16 bays, we always have 16p of downward force. If we have 17 bays, we have 17p of downward force. In this case, we have 16p downward, and the two reactions are each 8p in order to account for uh, equilibrium under the vertical forces on this system. Now, <clears throat> we want to record some data and we need to blow this thing up. So this is the left-hand half of the truss and that, this would be the symmetry line. Uh, and in fact, even this is not quite blown up enough to make it easy for us to write on it. So we're going to initially start off by just showing six full bays and eventually we'll shrink it down to uh, show the remainder. We're going to work half the truss 
it's understood that by the symmetry of the problem, we will then know what the other half of the truss looks like. So we're going to start with this joint B. So we're labeling A, B, C, D, E, F, and so forth. Um, and we're going to start with this joint because we know an external force there and we have two members framing in and those two members um, are horizontal and vertical and therefore um, there's only one unknown vertical and one unknown horizontal. So we arrive at this point and we say well there's a reaction AP upward on the on the joint that means the member that's framing in from above, which is the only member that can generate a vertical force, must be exerting an 8P force downward on this joint to equilibrate the 8P upward reaction. So we draw in this force. It's a force on this joint. It's a force due to this member. Now we know that if that member is pushing down on the joint, the joint by action-reaction pairs must be pushing back up on the bottom of the member and those two forces have to be equal in magnitude. So that means there's an upward force on the bottom of the member that resides in here and that force is being exerted by this joint. In order for that member to be in equilibrium, the joint up above must be pushing down on the member with an 8P force and by action-reaction pairs the member has to be pushing back up on this joint with an 8P force. Now rather than draw in the member and all those forces, we're simply going to state the fact that this member is in compression, so that's what this C designates, with a force of magnitude 8P, and we've just verbalized how all that force transfer takes place through action-reaction pairs and equilibrium and action-reaction pairs again, but we don't need to record all of that. We need to verbalize it for ourselves so that we understand it. But in this simplified system, we're going to describe the state of that member as an 8P force in compression. And now we've drawn that 8P force upward on the bottom of this joint to indicate what the member is doing to it. So in a sense, this 8P, 8P force is get, getting transferred through the joint, through the member, and on up to that joint, and nothing is occurring along the way to change the magnitude of it. So this is, as we mentioned before, this whole process along this line is like a little column that's taking whatever this force is and just transferring it up to that joint. Now, we haven't finished resolving this joint yet, so what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, there are no horizontal forces on that joint. This member could exert a horizontal force, but it doesn't want to or it shouldn't because if it did, it would uh, throw this joint out of equilibrium. So this must be a zero force member that's just basically keeping this whole system balanced from flopping over, but it's not an active agent in any way in the truss action that's involved in the spanning system. So we drew no arrow on this joint and we draw no arrow on this joint due to this member. So when we get to that joint we'll understand that because this says 0P um, it's not an active agent in terms of its influence on this joint. And by the way we wrote C here just because we were copying text over but it really shouldn't even say C because a zero force is neither compression nor tension. All right, so now we can jump up to this joint. We have an unknown horizontal. We have an unknown horizontal and an unknown vertical from the web. Fortunately, we can solve for that unknown vertical immediately because it's the only unknown vertical. And so we're gonna look at this joint and we're gonna say there's an 8P upward force a 0.5p downward force, which leaves a net 7.5p upward force, which means this member has to be pulling down, and it has to be pulling down with a vertical component of 7.5. So we're going to draw that this way. We'll show the arrow along the diagonal. And by the way, another way we're simplifying things is we're no longer showing 
uh, the two arrows corresponding to the two components. We're just saying we know that this is a diagonal force. It has to be along the direction of the diagonal web member. And so we draw that force in the appropriate direction so that we know that we can equilibrate the other forces like this 8P upward and the 5P downward. Um, and now in this new bookkeeping system, to further simplify the amount of data we have to do, we're just going to record the values once of these components. So in this system, we've drawn a little triangle here. Along the vertical edge, we're showing the vertical component of this force. And along the horizontal, we're showing the horizontal component. And then, of course, we can apply the Pythagorean theorem or trigonometry to say that the overall force in this member is going to equal 7.5p times the square root of 2, which is 10.6p. And in parentheses, we've put tension to indicate that that's the state of stress in this member. And we know that has to be true because that member cannot be pulling down and to the right on the joint unless the joint is pulling back on the member. So this member is pulling down and to the right on that joint and pulling up and to the left on this joint, and it's doing so with a force of magnitude 10.6p overall, which has components of 7.5p. So now if we go back up to joint A, we see that we have resolved the verticals, the vertical and the horizontal having to do with the diagonal. The only unknown force remaining is this chord force and so when we look at this joint, we see that there's a component to the right due to this diagonal force. That component to the right is of magnitude 7.5p. This member is the only member that can equilibrate that, so it will have to exert a force to the left on this joint of 7.5p. So that looks like this. And we go through the usual verbalization. We don't write all this down, but we verbalize the fact that this member is pushing on this joint to the left. By action-reaction pairs, that means the joint is pushing back on the member with a 7.5p force. In order for the member to be in equilibrium, it has to have another force on the right end being exerted by this joint, and that force is pushing to the left which is creating a state of compression in that member. And then by action-reaction pairs, if this joint is pushing to the left on the member, the member must be pushing to the right on the joint. So we see uh, these forces basically being passed through in this very linear, straightforward way, um, where this member working in compression is pushing out on that joint to the left and pushing outward on this joint to the right. And these joints are in turn pushing in on the member, which is creating this state of compression. Okay, so that resolves everything at joint A. And now we want to jump down to joint D, because that's where we have more meaningful information. We've got an unknown vertical, an unknown vertical, an unknown horizontal, in an unknown horizontal, so we don't want to go to joint C because we don't have enough information at that point to work anything out. But we can jump down to joint D and we can resolve either the verticals or the horizontals. And typically in parallel chord trusses, we get systematized just doing the verticals right off the bat. So at joint D, we have a 7.5p upward force which is the upward component of this diagonal. There's a member in here, which will end up pushing down on this joint with a 7.5p force uh, in order to keep this joint uh, in vertical equilibrium. So if we go show that, it looks like this. So there's a 7.5p force down on the joint due to this member. By action and reactions, joint D is pushing back up on the member with a 7.5p force, which is producing a state of compression in the member. In order for the member to remain in equilibrium, uh, 
it has to have a downward force on the top, which is exerted by joint C, and then by action-reaction pairs, that means the member is pushing back up on joint C with an upward force of 7.5 P. So this member is pushing down on that joint and pushing up on that, and they are in turn pushing down and up on the member in such a way to create compression of a magnitude 7.5 P. So we've resolved the verticals at this joint D. Now we have to resolve the horizontals, and they're very straightforward also. There's a 7.5 P component of this diagonal, which is pulling to the left, and that means this member has to be pulling to the right on joint D. So we show that in this way. This member is pulling to the right on joint D. That means joint D is pulling to the left on it, which is creating a state of tension in that member of magnitude 7.5 P. And in order for that member to be in equilibrium, if in fact this joint is pulling to the left on it, this joint has to be pulling to the right. And by action-reaction pairs, that means this member has to be pulling to the left on the joint. So we've shown these two arrows that represent the action of the member on the joints, and then we have summarized the state of stress or the force in the member as 7.5 P in tension. Now we have enough information to jump back up to joint C and resolve its equilibrium. Again, we're going to start with the verticals because there's only one unknown vertical, and that's the vertical component of the diagonal. We're going to say there's an upward force of 7.5 P on the bottom of this joint. There's a downward applied force of 1 P. That leaves a net upward force of 6.5 P, which means this diagonal has to be pulling downward with a vertical component of 6.5 P. So that looks like that. This joint then, this member rather, is pulling down on that joint and pulling up on this joint and the joints in turn are tending to pull outward or to stretch the member so we designate its state of force as tension and again 6.5 times the square root of 2 uh, gives us the overall magnitude of the force in that member. All right so now I can finish resolving joint C by saying, first we go back, there is a 6.5p horizontal component from this diagonal, and there is a 7.5p force to the right due to this chord member. Those two forces are both to the right. So when we add them together, we get 7.5p to the right and 6.5p to the right and that means 14p overall. That means this member has to push back on that joint with a 14p force. So that looks something like this. The member is pushing to the left on the joint. That means the joint is pushing back on the member, creating a state of compression. In order for the member to remain in compression in equilibrium, joint E has to be pushing to the left on the member, and by action-reaction pairs, that means the member is pushing to the right on this joint. Again, I reiterate, you only draw arrows that represent forces on joints. And the state of the, being of the members is accounted for by these little summary statements that say what the magnitude of the force is and whether that force is in tension or compression. Now we have enough information to jump down to joint F. We have an unknown vertical and an unknown horizontal. And again, we're going to solve the vertical first. Not that we have to at this joint because we only have one unknown in either of those two directions. We can immediately solve for either, but we're going to jump to this vertical member and we're going to say it has to equilibrate the vertical component of this diagonal. So this diagonal is pulling up and to the left. The upward component is 6.5 P, which means this member has to be pushing down on the joint 
with a 6.5p force in order to keep the joint in equilibrium. So that means if that member is pushing down on the joint, the joint's pushing back on the member, which is creating compression in the member of magnitude 6.5. In order for the member to be in equilibrium, the joint above has to push down on it. That means the member is pushing back on the joint with a force of 6.5p. So we now have all of our vertical components at this joint except the diagonal. But before we jump up to that joint, we're going to finish off joint F. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to say we've got to resolve all the horizontals. So we have a 7.5p pull to the left due to this cord. We have a horizontal component of 6.5p associated with this diagonal. Both those forces are pulling to the left on joint F. 6.5p plus 7.5p is 14p to the left, which means this member has to be pulling with a force of magnitude 14p to the right, which looks like that. So this member is pulling to the right on the joint. The joint is pulling back on the member. That's creating tension in the member. Uh, in order to keep the member in equilibrium, this member, this joint, has to be pulling to the right on the member, which means the member is pulling on the joint to the left. So now we've resolved everything having to do with joint F. We can jump to joint E. And before we do that, we're going to resolve verticals because we have one unknown vertical component. We have a horizontal and a horizontal, so we don't want to do the horizontal equation first because if we wrote it out, we just have to go find some information somewhere else because it would have two unknowns in one equation. So we're going to look at this joint and we're going to ask about vertical equilibrium. We have 6.5p upward, 1p downward, which is a net of 5.5p. And that's upward, which means this diagonal has to be pulling down with a vertical component of 5.5p. So this force is exerting a 5.5p vertical component, which balances out the net effect of this 6.5p upward force and that 1p downward force. So vertically now this is in equilibrium. And by the way, I assume this is obvious, but I, each time I've been writing this vertical and that horizontal component is being equal. Same here, same here. And the reasoning of course is this is square base. So this is a 45 degree slope and the two components, the vertical and horizontal components have to be the same. All right, so now we're going to this joint and we see that we have at that joint, two horizontals. One is a 5.5p to the right associated with this diagonal and one is a 14p to the right on that joint associated with the, um, the pushing force that this member is exerting on that joint. So both those forces are in the same direction. We add them together and we get 19.5p to the right that means this member has to be pushing back on that joint with a force of 19.5p. So when we go draw that in, we see a force to the left on the joint. And by the various processes we've discussed and described several times now, that means this member is also pushing to the right on joint G. And joint G and E are pushing inward on the member creating a state of compression with a magnitude of 19.5p. Again, we don't have enough information to jump, jump to joint G, but we can jump down to H and we can resolve the vertical very quickly. We have a 5.5p vertical component associated with this diagonal. This is the only member that can equilibrate that. So when we draw in its effects, it has to be pushing down on the joint with a 5.5p force. The joint's pushing back on it, creating compression. 
And to stay in equilibrium, this mem member has to have a 5.5p force on the top of it, pushing downward from joint G, and by action-reaction pairs, that means this member is pushing back up on joint G with a force of magnitude 5.5p. So now we've completely resolved joint H. We can ju jump to joint G. Resolving the verticals first, we have 5.5p up, 1p down for a net of 4.5p up. That means this diagonal has to be pulling downward and it has to do so with a vertical component of 4.5p. And somehow, in going from there to there, I've resolved a couple of issues. Uh, first of all, the verticals have been taken care of. So the, two, the component is 5.5 by geometry. This, excuse me, the vertical component of the diagonal force is 4.5p. By geometry, the horizontal component is 4.5p. And now when I look at this horizontal component of this member and the horizontal component exerted by this cord, it's 19.5 plus 4.5. They're added together because they're both to the right, which means this cord member has to be exerting a 24p force to the left in order to keep joint G in equilibrium. So now we can jump down to joint J and we resolve the vertical and horizontal components. This 4.5 downward is to equilibrate the 4.5 upward component associated with this. And the 24 to the right is to equilibrate this pull to the left of 19.5 due to this cord member, plus the pull to the left of 4.5, which is the horizontal component of that diagonal. Those add together to give 24p to the left, so this web member has to pull with 24p to the right. We now jump up to joint I, and again, we're resolving both verticals and horizontals. We have 4.5p up, 1p down, so this has to be a downward force with a vertical component of 3.5. By geometry, this has to be 3.5. And now on this joint, we have 24p pushing to the right on the joint, 3.5 pulling to the right. When we, we add them together, because they're both going in the same direction, we get 27.5. And this member has to be pushing on the joint to the left in order to equilibrate that. So now we jump down to joint L. This 3.5 vertical component of this member is, a, is equilibrated now by a downward force of 3.5 from this vertical. So it's pushing down on that joint and up on that joint. And again, we resolve the horizontals. We have 24 to the left due to the effect of this member, 3.5 to the left due to this diagonal which is 27.5p to the left. And this is the only member that can make up all of that. So this bottom cord member is in tension with a magnitude of 27.5. And now we can jump up to joint K and we resolve the verticals. Again, we have 3.5 up, 1.5p down. That's a net of 2.5. This member has to pull down with a vertical component of 2.5p. By geometry, this has to be equal. And now when we go resolve the horizontals on this joint, we have 2.5p to the right due to this diagonal. We have 27.5p to the right, which is the push from this top cord. 27.5 and 2.5 add together to 30, all to the right. So this member has to push back on that joint with a 30p force. All right, so if we finish up the entire truss, we, we were in the sixth bay. Um, each time, by the way, you'll begin to see some patterns. Like we started with a very large web force, and every time we crossed one of these 1p forces, the web force went down from a vertical component of 7.5 to 6.5 to 
4.5, 3.5, 2.5, 1.5, and finally 0.5. So the last bay we were looking at up there was this 2.5. We crossed another P force and another one, and we end up with this 0.5 P vertical and horizontal components in the web member. And by the way, when we get to this joint and we resolve all the forces, we discover that this web is also 0.5 and 0.5, which is one of our prime indicators that we've actually done things correctly because we know that when we cross over this line, we better have symmetry between what's on the right and what's on the left. The other thing was we had a 30 P force. Every time we cross a diagonal, we increase the chord force. So here we had 7.5, we added this diagonal of 6.5 to jump it up to 14. Then we added 5.5 to jump it up to 19.5. Then by 4.5 to jump it up to 24. We had gotten up to 30. And when we crossed this joint, we had one and a half to make it 30 and a half. And when we crossed this joint, we had 0.5 to make it 32. So the diagonals are what are throwing additional force into the chord members. And every time we cross a joint like this that has a diagonal in it, we change the chord force. And initially the, the diagonals have very large forces, so the jump in the chord force is large. But as the web forces diminish towards the center, the jumps are smaller. So here we only had a 0.5p horizontal component. So we jumped from 31.5 to 32. Now, those are patterns which you'll learn to have in your head and they will add to your intuition. They are not a substitute for the right method. The right method insists that you go through joint by joint and apply the laws of equilibrium and the laws of action-reaction pairs rigorously. Patterns are useful as checks and to add to your intuition, but there are no patterns ever that replace the fundamental principles. And if you start off trying to substitute patterns that you see, you will discover that they will abandon you very rapidly. So you have to be careful how you do this. Having said all that though, I'm going to show you one other pattern that's useful to sort of check yourself You'll see that's 7.5, 7.5, 14, 14, 19.5, 19.5. And that pattern persists all the way through. And um, that's often a good thing to look for because if you don't see that pattern, it may mean you've made a mistake. You should never rely on that pattern, though, as your means of generating this diagram. I cannot overemphasize the importance of sticking with the method, and in particular where the method of joints is concerned, you have to go one joint at a time and resolve equilibrium at, the joint, at those joints to make sure you've done it right. Okay, so <clears throat> this is um, a multi-frame printout. Uh, that's a graphic representation of what we were just looking at. So you'll notice these large forces like 32P at the center here, and then really very small uh, diagonal forces. The diagonal forces increase linearly, 0.5, 1.5, 2.5, 3.5, on up to 7.5. The variation in the chord forces is different. It starts off rapidly increasing and then does so very gradually near the middle. This is a parabolic variation. This is a linear variation in the webs. So when we go look at this, if we pass the line through here that hit the sort of average points, we produce a parabola for the variation in the top chord force and the bottom chord force. If we looked at the variations in the web, they're very linear. Each time we go from that web to that, we add one on the component, then we added one more, and then another one, and then another one, and so forth, to go from 0.5 at the center all the way up to 
uh, 7.5 at the end diagonals. So this is a graphic representation of what you're looking at. Now you'll recall I said we're pretty happy when we get to the center here and these webs are symmetric. Um, and in fact, at that point, relative to the web forces, we're so comfortable, we're going to say we wouldn't even analyze the second half of the truss. Um, but we do need to be worried that we made a mistake in our cord forces, because when we get to this joint, we got 32p, and by the nature of the way things frame into that joint, this obviously has to be 32p. But uh, that's because of equilibrium of this joint. But that doesn't mean that we didn't make a mistake in arriving at this 32p. In other words, every step of the way along here, we had to add something to that to get that. We added something to that to get that. We added something to that to get that. And if we made a mistake in those additions anywhere, we could arrive at the point where this force was wrong, and yet by the nature of the equilibrium of that joint, we would deduce that this is symmetric on this side. Um, therefore, symmetry between that number and that number does not imply we have the right answer. Symmetry between these two is a meaningful check. That's not a meaningful check. So we would like to have a meaningful check that allows us to figure out whether we got the right force at the center of this truss, because that's where the worst cord forces are, and we'd like to know that we got those right, because that's one of the most likely modes of failure of our truss. So we're going to uh, supplement what we've just done, which is called the joints method, or the method of joints, um, where we step through joint by joint by joint in order to figure out what was going on. And we're going to use something called the method of sections. And the way this works is we, we take some part of this truss where we're concerned, like right here, we're concerned at what's happening in one or the other of these bays. And we create a free body that slices through that bay. And we go check that free body uh, as another way of finding the cord forces at this crucial location in the truss. So we're going to redraw this truss without all this internal detail, just the external forces, and we're going to create a free body that's sliced along this line through these members, so we're looking at forces in those members. Don't slice through the joints because you don't even know what that means. But as long as you get out in the middle of the members, you know that they're in a state either of pure compression or pure tension. And you can, uh, you can rely on your analysis to give you a meaningful answer. So, we're creating a free body which consists of all of this sliced through that seventh bay. So when I do that, I have this slice point, and then I have three seven bay, excuse me, I slice through the eighth bay, which is the one just to the left of the center line of the truss. I could have gone to the one just to the right, but this seemed simpler. So now I've drawn this free body. I have an AP reaction. I have my usual joint loads across the top, and I can now accumulate this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven P forces into a 7p force at the center of action of those seven. So I line it up with the middle one, and I'm not quite sure, I think that's joint p. Whatever that symbol is, it shouldn't exist there. Um, all right, I've also drawn a c force here, a t force there, and a diagonal force, like so. Okay, so I've cleaned up this diagram a little bit. I got rid of that um, erroneous P. Um, I've changed this to capital C to the left, capital T to the right. This represents the compression in the top cord in bay 8. This represents the tension in the bottom cord in bay 8. Um, and then there's a diagonal force D in this member. For right now, we're going to take moments about a certain point, and the two points we've designated are Q2, 
which is at the intersection of that diagonal and that member. Uh, Q2 is not technically on this free body, but that makes absolutely no difference. We're allowed to take moments about any point we want to choose. And in this case, we're going to choose Q2 because it's at the intersection of this diagonal force and that tensile force which means neither one of them will enter into a moment equation and the moment equation will then just involve the one unknown force which is C in this top chord. So if I say sum of the moments about Q2 equals zero, uh, I'll start with this AP, 8P force which is tending to create clockwise rotation about this point and that AP, so I put a plus sign in front plus AP times its lever arm, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, S. Then I have this 0.5P force, which I could have clustered with the 8P, so I had a net 7.5 up, but I didn't think that helped that much. So this 0.5P is one additional force, which is tending to produce counterclockwise motion about Q2, and its lever arm is also 8s. So I have minus for counterclockwise. 0.5p is the magnitude of the force. 8s is the lever arm. Then I also have a negative or counterclockwise influence around Q2 due to this 7p. So I have minus 7p times its lever arm, which is in this case 4s. And then finally, I have a counterclockwise influence due to C. So counterclockwise is minus. C times its lever arm is S. And we know its lever arm is S because these are square bays, and therefore the depth of this truss has to be S. So I have plus 64. And by the way, all the S's cancel out. And so I have some terms with P's, and I have this term, which is just minus C. So I take that over to the other side, and I got 64p minus 4p minus 28p, which is 32p. So that's a check. We got the compressive force at the two center bays using the method of joints. We got a compressive force of 32p, and we're now getting a check on that by taking this free body uh, and applying it called the method of sections. So this is called the method of sections because we sliced a section through here and isolated off a portion of the truss as opposed to the method of joints where we isolate joints and we ask what has to be happening on those joints. That ends our first video on the simplified joints method as applied to a simple span 16 square bay truss where we have demonstrated a bookkeeping system that allows us to force focus on the forces on joints and play down the forces on members because the members are mainly serving to simply pass forces through from joint to joint.